extra props in the family that I was going to be on this. So it's oh, uh, really exciting. Aww. These uh, estrangements and issues with the extended family cause untold problems for couples. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today, we have our first solo interview. Okay, we have mentioned his books. Yes. More than any other reference we've made on the show. We actually gift them to a lot of our couples. Yes. I'm very excited about this. I'm honored that he took the time to join us today. We're talking about Dr. Carl Pillimer. He has authored 30 Lessons on Living. Yes. 30 Lessons on Loving. And his newest book, Fault Lines. Andrew and I have had more relationship, in-depth, like philosophical conversations regarding his books or stemming from his books than I think anything else we've talked about in a relationship. So Dr. Pilmer is a professor at Cornell University and he is a gerontologist, yes. which means that he works and studies with old people. Yeah. And so that's the inspiration for these books. It's to sit down with people who have lived a full life and get their lessons on living, loving. And then also his newest book dissects how family estrangements occur. So any rifts that have happened, any breaks in family ties that have happened, he wanted to understand why those happen and then also give words of wisdom as to how to repair these rifts. So you might be asking yourself, this is couple things. Why are we not listening to a couple? Well, we thought he had so much wisdom from talking to thousands and thousands of couples around the world that he could talk about and give such great advice and great wisdom about couples, relationships, and all of the drama that comes with it. Yes, and he doesn't just interview any couples. He interviews couples that have been married for decades. Yes. And we talk about this all the time on our show. We don't necessarily want to give advice. The inspiration for the show is to share our life experiences as they happen and the things that we're learning through them. Uh, by no means are we experts. By no means are we family counselors. But that's why we're excited to sit down with Dr. Pillimer because he is an expert and uh, he's spoken with so many different experts. He's an author. Anyway, we're very very excited. Again, uh, if you want to find out more about Dr. Pilmer and the books that he's written, I would legitimately recommend every single one of these books. Yes. These are staple books in my mind and they make my top 15 list for sure. We're going to link those down below and also more information about Dr. Pilmer if you're curious. And before we jump into the interview, please subscribe to the show and give it a rating on whatever platform you're listening on. It really helps us out. And let's just go ahead and roll into this one with Dr. Carl Pilmer. Let's do it. Well, Dr. Carl Pillimer, I gotta, I gotta say it is a true honor to have you here with us. And I, I want to start with two things. One, this is the first ever solo interview we've done. Usually we sit down with uh, a couple. And so I'm, I'm excited and anxious to see how this goes. The second issue I want to bring up is more of a, maybe like a bone I have to pick with you. Uh, I am just dying to know why you haven't written more books. Everything you've written so far has been so uh, life-changing, perspective-changing for me that I need you to write more books, Doc. Well, uh, maybe we can talk about that. I'm kind of <laughs> trying to think out, you know, the next yes. one. I also could go get my wife out of the other room. <laughs> but I feel really uh, excited to be the one solo interviewee. This is great, you know? Yeah. I, think it's, uh, I feel like it's a privilege. I wow. will say your book... 30 Lessons on Loving, well, and on living and fault lines, honestly, <laughs> has been more like it's been brought up more within our marriage and our like serious conversations than anything else. He's like, well, I don't know. The book says this, though. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. OK, OK. No. Well, so I, you know, I, do, I had these. Um, go ahead. Sorry. I, I do need to give a credit to my my friend uh, Boone, me who recommended your books first. But I, I have referenced multiple times mm -hmm. in the show your books. And mm -hmm. for those that don't know, uh, these books are all based off of Dr. Uh, Carl's experience as a gerontologist, where he sits down with elderly people and really gets their advice. And we'd love to hear what, what was your mission and passion behind that? I know there is a story there. You know, it it's so interesting. I mean, one thing which unites all these books, even though the most recent one is a different topic, I'm in general a real evidence-based guy, so I believe that if science has an answer, we should use it. But there are very complicated human problems that science doesn't have good answers for. And in that case, I felt that the next best thing was to go to actual living, breathing people who've experienced a problem and overcome it 
and distill their wisdom for overcoming the problem or their lessons for living with it uh, and make those available to other people. Mm. So that that's kind of been the idea. And I don't like to just do small groups. So you'll know from the books, each of them involves large scale surveys, lots of in-depth interviews, because I want to take advantage of the wisdom of crowds, mm. not just a few you know, interviews, but really get to the heart of it. Um, and as you said, each book kind of led to the other. I'd been a gerontologist for 25 years or so, and I realized all I was studying was old people as problems and the problems of old people. So I was studying things like chronic pain, Alzheimer's disease, elder abuse. It's like I was rewriting the book of Job for old people, basically. <laughs> and, and I just decided that was too narrow. So I had this sense, what if we go to the oldest people among us and ask them for their advice for living and not just Yoda like wisdom or like the mm. character that Morgan Freeman plays in every movie now, yes. but the but their practical advice for how to overcome life's major problems. And the one chapter in that first book, which was on how to get and stay married, people were the most interested in it. I learned that mm. couples were buying the book and leaving that chapter open and encouraging wedding guests at their wedding to write their lessons. So I got a lot of encouragement to go back and find really long married people. So people married 30, 40, or 50 or more years and ask them about their lessons for love relationships and marriage. Mm. And at the risk of going on too long, one of the things I learned from those two books and from interviewing old people is I asked them about their regrets in life. And over and over, I heard that a major regret was a family estrangement. Mm. It, that when you're 70 or 80 or 90, it nags at people that they die, that their parent died before they had time to reconcile, that they got into later life with a brother estranged or with their kids not seeing them. So each book formed its own progression, and each one has this theme of let's go ask people who've been through something and done something how mm. they did it and make that advice available for other people. So there's a link sort of between them. Yeah, I, I found the timing of the release of this book actually very appropriate with, uh, you know, one of the most, I, I feel like, <laughs> polarizing elections happening. We're obviously in a unique time with the pandemic, and there's a lot of varying views on how to approach that. And so when I first read this, you know, and Sean knows I'm a big <laughs> fan of yours, I, I have been uh, using the advice in this book uh, to kind of deal with with our own family, people who are, have impassioned beliefs uh, to kind of, you know, help people maintain a, a broader perspective of, hey, love the different, differing opinions and the different perspectives here. But let's not forget that family unity at the end of the day is um, is the most important thing. But on that note, I'm, I'm curious um, with something like politics, which your book discusses in Fault, Line, uh, Fault Lines, the, the idea is not to just withhold any and all opinions, right? It's, to, it's how to have more or less healthy conflict or deal with, um, deal with poorly dealt con conflict and how to move past that. Am I correct in saying that? You know, I think it's, I think the way you've summed it up is great. It's a little bit of both. And, and I'll, I'll start with your first thought, which is about, you know, this, extremely, one could even say poisonous kind of political debates that are now taking place in the country, but also in families. I said long before this election, I gave uh, the elders advice about how to deal with these difficult political conversations. Oddly enough, you know, 10 or more years ago, they give you a simple rule in your family. And by the way, sometimes these simple rules are really difficult to do, but at least it's a <laughs> simple rule. And that's ask yourself, do I have any possibility of changing this person's mind? So is there any possibility mm. that this person is going to shift their viewpoint? If the answer is no, then create a demilitarized zone. It's like a compulsion to repeat the same arguments over and over <laughs> in families. Mm. Um, and from researching this a little bit, I've learned something. Most of us hang around with people who share our political opinions and values. So a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter don't have much contact with those people. But so when they get their family, it's the one place they found someone they can unload mm. to for all of the past political misdemeanors. 
So one of the most astonishing things is how families grind through these same arguments over and over and over again. So in general, although discussion is good, if it's not an open and enjoyable and interesting political discussion, if it's a repetitive airing of grievances and there's no possibility of changing the other person's mind, my respondents argued for a demilitarized zone. Hmm. You know, to set boundaries, say, I won't do it. If we're going to, you know, if you're going to criticize my political views, I'll talk about anything else. If not, I'm going to vote with my feet. And it's amazing how quickly families then do move over to what they're binge watching. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just a person, you know, there's, I've come to a conclusion having interviewed many, many people now. These particular uh, value laden left and right political discussions are almost unresolvable in families and probably should be avoided, you know, g- given the kind of upset they're causing, because they really are. I mean, they're, as you've probably seen, they're, it's tremendously difficult for families and people won't let it go. And I think they have to. Today's show is brought to you by BetterHelp. When we sat down to plan out this year's plan for this podcast, we knew that we wanted to dedicate some episodes to mental health. Yes, making mental health a priority has been so helpful for ourselves and our relationship. BetterHelp is such an amazing resource and they have licensed therapists in all 50 states. Uh, We do view it as an investment in our future selves to seek therapy. And that's why we're thankful for a service like BetterHelp that makes it so easy to access. Therapy is truly one of the things that helped me get through some of my darkest times and really helped Andrew and I in our marriage. Which is why we love working with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest counseling service and it's 100% online. They will assess your needs online and match you with a licensed therapist that you can begin communicating with in under 48 hours. The service is available worldwide and you can sign in to send messages to your counselor at any time from anywhere. And it's more affordable than traditional therapy. Plus, we have a special deal just for our Couple Things listeners. Simply visit betterhelp.com slash eastfam to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash eastfam. Betterhelp.com slash eastfam. We'll also link that down below. On that note, I am curious in having conversations with the thousands of people that you have in couples, something that we talk about a lot with couples who come on the show is transparency and honesty. So trying not to push anything under the rug, trying to be very open, trying to make sure that nothing goes unturned <clears throat> in that you you sort through your issues before they become an issue. However, do you did you find, have you found that there are those topics and there are those things that are better left unsaid? And how how do you draw that line or how did they draw that line? You know, the elders who I interviewed, these very long married elders, uh, had some very clear advice on that. They really do emphasize honesty. And people, when you ask them at the end of a very long relationship what they regretted the most, it often was acts of dishonesty, Mm. not both active dishonestly, like an affair or something, but also not expressing their feelings enough. I had many older men who had lost their wives, whose major regret was not having expressed love more, not, you know, allowing their partner to be taken for granted. So I totally agree with you with that kind of honesty and opening. Now, they do make little exceptions. Like, (laughs) you know, um, for the question, do these pants make me look fatter? You know, for example, (laughs) they, they argue that you don't have to be brutally honest about everything and you can be selective. I think uh, with them, it's honesty in what really matters. And absolutely, Mm. they found a dishonesty, a lie, something early in a marriage. When you look back on it from the end of the marriage journey, it does create a like a real source of insecurity. So yeah, I would, I think that people who remain in very long marriages happily develop a way to communicate honestly. And let me say, Mm. I was interviewing people in their seventies and eighties and beyond men in that age range always told me they weren't great communicators. Uh, um, Some had been in the army where either they yelled at other people or were yelled at for four years or whatever. All of them had to learn some kind of basic 
communication strategies mm -hmm. where they could talk about things openly. I mean, he, the strong silent type may be attractive, but it's not good for a long-term marriage. Somebody uh -huh. has to be able to learn how to talk. And if people in your age range think they can't, I'll tell you, these were hardened, older people who learned how to do it. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the two mm. or three top things. Um, you know, this level of kind of uh, radical honesty in a relationship is really critical, except where you might bend it on some small <laughs> things where it doesn't make any difference. I, I don't know your thoughts on marriage, but I, I, I get geeked about the whole structure of, of marriage and the contractual side of it and, and kind of people's it's, it's, it's different than any other relationship that we're familiar with, uh, in our culture or society. But the cool thing about it, I think is in part that it provides this, uh, practice ground where you can actually, Hey, I'm not a good communicator and we might have, you know, 40 years together for me to mm -hmm. maybe practice it and get better at communicating. So, that idea is, is exciting because yeah, I, I feel like I've hopefully improved my communication over our years, but yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. You know, you raise an incredibly important point and, and I'm interested to talk about it specifically with you folks, because in your careers, you've had to, you know, engage now what in business or sports or the arts we'd call a discipline. And in all the books, and especially the marriage book, the idea of marriage as a discipline, uh, not, of course, in a punishment kind of mm -hmm. discipline, but a discipline in the sense of there's no ultimate success or failure. You're always trying to continually improve. There are clear ups and downs. And so there's no perfection. You expect, you know, a setback, how like you do in athletics, you have losses, you have injuries or whatever. And those kinds of setbacks and losses are used to strengthen whatever you're doing. Yeah. So I argued in the marriage book that that's basically what very long married people are talking about, mm. that it's not easy, as you found out. I mean, the marriage can be difficult. It can be challenging. But a really long marriage is really worth it. So yeah. if you talk to people who've gotten there, they'll say, I mean, everyone, every long married person has had one or two years um, where they thought that they might get divorced. So mm -hmm. everyone has these, you know, mm -hmm. valleys where they're despondent about the relationship. And it's by practicing that kind of discipline of accepting that you're in it for, for the long term really makes a huge difference. I found the same thing, too, with people who had reconciled after estrangement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you estranged from your brother, estranged from your mother, for 10 or 15 years. It's not instantaneous when you get back. It's again, a discipline where you mm. learn about yourself, you get stronger, you, you muster your social support and you get help. And if it doesn't work out right away, you try again and again and again. So, so I think you hit on it exactly that um, it's a, people want this like instant gratification. And if a relationship goes poorly for a short period of time, they feel like they should be yeah. out. Yeah. Rather than seeing those challenges as opportunities to get stronger personally, as well as, you know, as a, um, um, a relationship. Yeah. And we, we've learned a lot of things on the show. One couple, I think, phrased it very uh, appropriately and said that anytime they get in a big argument, they always remind themselves, hey, we know how this argument ends. And that's with us still married. And I think like, you know, I'm not big on rah-rah motivation, but having <laughs> that in the back of your mind of like, not just being in the moment and be like, oh, I feel all these feelings of frustration and anger, but knowing deep down that this ends with us still married, we just have to get to the other side of this uh, is is really good. And it certainly applies to family situations as well. I would love without maybe you, you know, spoiling the book so people <laughs> can, can still uh, go out and purchase it and, and learn all of the things, but what have you found in your research were maybe three buckets of family estrangements. Yeah, there, there are, there are actually are sort of three big areas. One are ones which are caused by what I would call the long arm of the past. Mm. So that really life is so adverse in childhood, harsh parenting, child abuse, horrible sibling rivalry, et cetera, that mm. even if things have gotten better later, people just can't get over it. Mm. Divorce when children are young, 
both on my research and others can lead to an estrangement from the non-custodial parent. So that's one bucket. A second bucket are what I might call a sociocultural views, namely values and expectations. Mm. That values drive a lot of our relationships everywhere. And we gravitate towards people who share our values and move away from those who don't. So strong value differences, violated expectations can help lead to an estrangement. Hmm. Um, and then there were two strong situational factors, and one of which really relates to, to your folks' interest. I'll do the other one first. Money may not be the root of all evil, but it hmm. certainly is the root of a lot of family estrangements. So issues around inheritance, business uh, affairs, et cetera. And, and most relevant here is what I call in the book, uh, the problematic in-law. Mm. That, uh, you know, their um, estrangements are surprising, or maybe not that surprising, number of estrangements emerge when a person has, in the family's viewpoint, married the wrong person. or And, and that can mm. take a range of possibilities. Either the person deliberately tries to pull the person away from their family, uh, the family doesn't get along with him or her, so that in-law issues wind up being a pretty strong factor in family estrangements, mm. so more so than I would have thought they would have been. I, that's been brought up within our conversations with other people um, many times, whether it's with dating or engagement. People are constantly asking us, how do we know if the person is the one? What if their family doesn't approve? What if we're of a different religion? What if it's all these like buckets of things that cause issue within that family and an extended family. Have you seen or heard from people that there are ways to get around it or are those just boundaries that unfortunately don't work within long-term marriages? So if you ask very long married people what some of their secrets are in terms of getting into a relationship, they say some things that might be difficult for people to hear. But one of the things they do say is opposites may attract, but when it comes to a long-term marriage, it's much more birds of the feather. Mm. Small differences work out, but especially core value differences, you know, how you want to spend money or how you want to spend your career time, those often push couples apart. So one mm. of the things which very long married people will tell you, and there's some research on this too, marrying someone who's broadly similar to you makes sense. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, if you're in love in a Romeo and Juliet kind of situation, it just means you should anticipate that it's going to be challenging. Mm. Very similarly, long married elders will tell you, take your partner's, your future partner's family into consideration as you make the decision. Again, they say, don't reject him or her because their family is difficult. But understand that the family of origin doesn't go away and you may be embroiled in controversy with them for as long as you're married. So their key point, you know, older people will tell you, choose carefully. Mm. Don't ever the dude, gee, it's time for me to get married or I'm afraid I'm running out of options or whatever. They want people to, you know, enter it uh, with their head. Um, if I could add one thing, though, which you mentioned, People forget that marriage is a contract. It's not just, you're, you know, you're head over heels in love. It means mm -hmm. your finances are going to be enmeshed with somebody else. If you're looking at somebody who can't handle money and, and it's important to you, you've got to act with your head as well as your heart, they would say. And think, you know, like in the old days that, you know, the elders would use an expression like good marriage material. You know, <laughs> and they encourage people to think in that way, at least a little. Is this person going to hold down a job, contribute to the house, be a decent parent? And I think you've probably seen it, too. In the early stages, especially of falling in love with somebody, you know, you aren't sitting down having core having conversations like, do our core child rearing values align? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's uh, in fact, it's probably the way to end the first date, you know, right <laughs> yeah. after that. But, but they argue that, you know, eventually, can I tell you one other thing they said that just given your background? Please. So, you know, they give little tips as well as big tips. And many elders from different cultures completely surprisingly gave me the advice watch how your prospective partner plays games. 
So I interviewed Dominicans well, who have a Domino's table in their house. I went to Chinese senior centers where everyone's playing mahjong. Uh, you know, I had the one uh, Chinese American woman said, I watched how he played mahjong. You know, I saw how he could accept defeat. I saw that he could be competitive, but not angry. Uh, mm -hmm. It was surprising how many people said, you know, I fell in love uh, when I saw, you know, we were on a soccer team together and I saw how he dealt with it. So I thought that was an interesting piece of advice. Huh. Watch how your partner is involved in something where he or she's not aware that you're watching and see, you know, the, the person who throws the chessboard at the wall when he <laughs> or she loses may not make good marriage material. So anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> A couple of things. The modern ab adaptation of uh, uh, is she marriage material is kind of <laughs> yeah. could she be wifey? Is kind of <laughs> yeah. Is that is, is that wifey material? <laughs> yeah. Second thing is Sean and I. Sean is very competitive, and yeah. I find it attractive just as long as it's not us competing against each other. So yes. that's that's my yes. uh, that's my two cents there. I do want to further on that though because I feel like we've talked a lot about this within other episodes. I feel like we live in a culture of people almost being brainwashed that there is the one person for them. And it's this belief that if as long as they find them, marriage will be easy and everything will be butterflies and rainbows and it will be the perfect marriage. We aren't personal believers of that. We feel like it's a choice that you tru truly make every single day to work for your marriage. But what what would be the perspective of the elders of how did they find their person? Was it the one? Was it this Romeo and Juliet situation? Or was it the choice that they made day in and day out? There's so many points in there. You're right, because really, there are like 2.5 billion people, you know, who you could get involved with. So the idea that there's only one probably doesn't make sense. You know, there's a filtering process. For one thing, you have to be able to find them. So I agree <laughs> with you. I think that expectation is unrealistic. And in the internet meme, you see expectations or disappointments waiting to happen. <laughs> yes. I think you're absolutely right that, that, that the idea that marriage is going to solve your problems, that it's going to be the be all and end all is unrealistic. And I think that it, um, um, it absolutely gets people into problems. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, so the elders said two things which sound contradictory. One I've already mentioned that you should, also approach this uh, with your head, that, that, this, that you have to look objectively at whether the person is going to be able to be the kind of person that you want him or her to be. That was point one. Two, if there was one point they made where they literally or figuratively pounded their fists on the table, said, if there's one thing you should tell people who are going to buy your book, it's that abandon any idea of changing the person's going to change after you marry them. Mm that they all, many of them had done it. And they didn't speak usually strongly, but they used things like, if you believe that you're an idiot, you're foolish. It's just an absolutely idiotic idea that your partner's going to be a do-it-yourself project. That, you know, if you, they said again and again, if your partner's idea of humor is whoopee cushions and a hand, buster, <laughs> a, a hand buzzer, that's not going to be funnier 10 years from now. <laughs> you know, that, you know, the idea. So the notion that people will change because you want them to was one of their absolutely strongest. You have to ask yourself, can I live with all these characteristics of the person before getting married? Finally, I think they would. But they, they also said that's logic for you, that you need what they referred to as this in love feeling, that, that there was nobody, I would say, in a happy marriage who didn't have what they would call like an irrational sense, a feeling of certainty, mm -hmm. a feeling maybe not even so much, you know, I can live with this person as I can't live without this person, or it feels that way. And people who got married and didn't have that, and I give a long anecdote in the book of someone who was being pushed into marriage and got out, you know, and got into a terrible marriage as a result. People who didn't have what they call this feeling, this sort of in love feeling is the way they put it, just didn't do well. So your listeners have to hold two different ideas in their minds right now. You've mm -hmm. got to, they would say, you've got to have that instinctual push towards the person, but you can't park your reason at the door. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you have it, if, if, 
if you can identify obstacles that aren't going to change, that you're not going to be able to tolerate, you've got to also have those in mind. So on, on a similar kind of mindset and, and speaking about the topic of change, it is interesting because how do you balance not having the expectation of changing the partner, but fully realizing that the, the long-term effect will probably be, probably be some type of change. Do you know, am I wrong in saying that? I feel mm -hmm. like, I feel like I've changed so much. You grow mm -hmm. and mature, but you're saying I shouldn't have the expectations that that's going to happen for her. That's a great nuance. You're absolutely right. Because people do change yeah. um, and we can encourage our partners to change, but you know, they do have to want to, it's the yeah. idea of imposing change on someone else, mm. but it's true. I mean, I've changed a lot in my relationship over the years, but there was a level of willingness and a realization no. that I should do it. And it couldn't have been expected in advance that I would, it turned out I did. Mm. So I think, I think that's a great nuance. That, that's exactly right. People definitely change, grow, develop, uh, and they do so as part of their relationship. I mean, yeah. you, I'm sure, you know, um, you know, the famous reason why married men live longer than unmarried men is typically their spouses make them go to the doctor. You know, I this mean, is true. You know, this is true. Yes, this is true. Yes, it is true. Yeah. Oh my God. So there's a longevity benefit, especially for men and uh, <laughs> married men that generally have, have somewhat better health habits and especially wives or, you know, spouses in, uh, are prone to noticing something's wrong with them. And men have a definite, not a sexist a thing here, like a research-based one. Huh. Men are more reluctant to seek help for almost anything <laughs> that's wrong with them. That's so funny. yeah, like that's, that's one of the hypotheses, why there's a marriage bonus in health mm -hmm. for men. Today's show is also brought to you by Athletic Greens. Babe, do you ever get annoyed at or just forget to take your vitamins? I feel like I'm pretty on top of it, but I don't always love taking them. That's one of the many reasons why I love taking Athletic Greens. It's so easy. One, just one scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. It is. It's pretty incredible. And their formula works together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase energy and focus, aid with digestion, and supports a healthy immune system. Plus, it tastes great. Seriously, we have tried so many different green powder drinks and Athletic Greens is by far the best tasting. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, and contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. We honestly recommend it to everyone. It's such an easy thing to incorporate into your daily routine that really makes a big dent in improving your health. Yes, simply visit athleticgreens.com forward slash East fam and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com forward slash East fam and get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Let's get back to it. So you mentioned the maybe three buckets of estrangement are, or three causes are the past, uh, values, and then expectations and in-laws. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, yeah, and yeah. I mean, the big events that happen, you know, there's this sort of, you know, the pressures of society where in, in terms of expectations and values yeah. with family members where but we have these beliefs, blood is thicker than water, your siblings should always have uh, your back, your parents should always support you, kids should support their parents. There's so much pressure placed on people. And very often, if people want to reconcile, they have to drop a lot of those expectations. Wow. And uh, yeah, one of the things I learned about a reconciliation, almost everybody who'd been estranged from a close relative and then reconciled after 10 or 20 years, uh, the question they had to ask themselves was, what's the least I can accept? So will I accept a less than perfect relationship? Is it still mm -hmm. worth it? So I'll give you an example that's marriage related. One of the folks in the book uh, that was estranged from her daughter, that they'd had a very difficult relationship, couldn't see her grandkids. And her daughter offered her one more chance and said, look, you can come and visit once every couple of months. You can't stay with us. You have to stay in a hotel. Mm. Your second husband can't come at all. And I will never discuss him with you. You know, he can't even be mentioned. And the mother did the calculation and said, okay, that did open up later. Mm. 
but so, so, so that's the thing with expectations. Mm. You know, the many, there was a, there was a, there were quite a few people where someone was caring for an older parent. So say you're caring for your mother or father and your siblings don't step up. It's a very common situation. P- people, if they wanted to reconcile, if that had caused a rift, had to say to themselves, it's not the kind of person he was and I can't expect this of him. So I think that that's where the expectations come in is, you know, um, in order to reconcile after a long rift, people had to ask themselves, can I live with a person who's not going to live up to my expectations? Wow. On top of this, you also mentioned the uh, the idea of money and inheritance. Is it true that uh, that the old saying, mo mo money, mo problems? (laughs) It's one of my favorite songs, by the way. They, uh, <laughs> wait, isn't that Biggie? No, it's uh, I. I, I, I thought more money, was, more problem. I thought it was Biggie. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it is. Uh, they um, uh, money is a really complex issue, and especially inheritance for a couple of really interesting reasons. One of those is that even if you give all your money equally to your kids. You can't divide a family business or a house, nor can you divide that grandfather clock that came over from the old company country or the chip Thanksgiving Mm. platter that served turkey for 50 years, you know, at at Thanksgiving. So that's one problem. Two, there's a thing about a will. It's a person's Mm -hmm. statement into eternity, basically. I mean, it's this big zero sum decision that carries a lot of emotional uh, weight And uh, yeah, I was shocked at how many uh, estrangements really did come from even loans gone bad. Now, I will say those were ones that were somewhat more prone to reconcile after Mm -hmm. years. These really deep seated childhood issues are harder to overcome. But the one thing also I was thinking, there's enormous collateral damage. And it is very, these estrangements prove to be very hard on couples. Mm -hmm. If if one person is dealing with an estrangement, say with a parent and maybe considering reconciling, it's very emotionally stressful. You know, a spouse might see the other person's side, for example. I mean, I've seen that in my own family where, you know, the spouse might actually be advocating for the difficult brother and, you know, they we could say the husband can't see it. So there's so what I call in the book collateral damage of estrangement. It ripples down into families mm-hmm. And if, say, a wife is having a really difficult relationship with her sister, you know, I had husbands say to me, because I interviewed some family members, I mean, all I hear about is what happened with her sister today. You know, there's no other Mm -hmm. emotional room. So, you know, we call the family a system for a reason. And there's definitely this sort of ripple effect or collateral damage on couples if one is having these kind of intense conflicts with their own family. And you may have seen it with other folks you've, uh, yeah. um, you know, you've talked to. Yeah. I found the, the, the money issue so interesting because it's almost like this glitch in priorities with our society where, you know, in the time of GameStop and mm-hmm. Bitcoin and everybody's almost not to say the only purpose is to get rich quick, but that's definitely a, a motivation. Uh, it's like, well, okay. But if this is one of the causes of family rifts, you know, how are you prioritizing this? And are you keeping in mind uh, navigating this wisely, you know, and, and not making it an issue? So, you know, it's anyway. so it was so cool because we got the interview close to 50 college students. So emerging adults uh, who had estrangements in their families and they just couldn't get over it. They would say again and again, you know, I loved my cousins. My father and his brother had a horrible business deal. Now we can't see that whole side of the family just over money. Mm. Like, I mean, outside observers are really stunned. I'm doing some work actually now with an institute that deals with this concern in family businesses. Mm. And again, you know, these, these rupturing of whole families because of the money. I mean, you're right. It, it seems like it should be more trivial, but I think it gets bound up with, mm. you know, emotion. And it's also zero sum. Mm. You know, there, there's sometimes where there can't be an equitable decision and that drives people crazy. But, you know, the one thing which people going through it say again and again, act quick, get mediation, mm. get help to deal with it, and don't involve the whole rest of your family. Even if you and your brother are having troubles, 
Don't have the nieces and nephews not be in contact with one another. Keep the family together, even if an estrangement is starting to occur between two people. And that because goes for any estrangement. Act quickly yeah. and take care of it. As, yeah. And oh my gosh, I just think that's such valuable mm-hmm. advice. I was, I, as I read that in your book, I was thinking through the effect of, you know, when Sean and I have a little beef. I'll go tell my friends about it. And then they're kind of yes men to my cause. They're like, yeah, dude, I can't believe she freaking did that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you kind of solidify your, you cement in your mind, like, yeah, I was right. And then you go back. And so anyway, time only increases the, uh, I I feel like the, the idea that I was right. And the sooner we can just nip that, nip that in the bud, the better. You know, that is a great point. And it, and makes me think of something else. It's really helpful in a couple, and I hadn't thought about it quite this way until you know you, you you talked about them. These family patterns of cutting someone off, even if it isn't an estrangement, that if you disagree or you have difficulties, you emotionally cut them off. Over and over, people told me that was passed down in a family to them. Mm. So, and that they had seen it in their parents. You know, this was how they operated if they were having trouble with one of the children they would just sort of cut off all contact with them or really isolate them. And I think people do carry that over Mm. into their marriages and into their relationships. You know, Mm. the idea that if we can't get along, I'm going to withdraw or I'm going to be emotionally withholding. And I think uh, that's another reason to work it out, you know, in your families, because it becomes a model for future relationships for your kids. Wow. If you were to look collectively at all of your books and all of the information that you've collected from all of these couples and people with estrangements and conflict, what seemed to be um, the worst case scenarios, if that may, like what was, what was the hardest conflict for people to kind of work their way through within a marriage? You know, I think in a marriage, Things that involve core betrayal. And the one thing I noticed in my uh, book, in the book, 30 Lessons for Loving, a number of people had been able to reconcile with their partner after an affair. Mm -hmm. So there were some people who said that uh, this was not the worst thing that that had happened in their 50 or 60 year marriage. But it's when betrayals cut to the core of the other person. And this is true in estrangement as well. When the rejection is so powerful and calls your whole identity into question, you know, so where there's more of a complete rejection of the person. And that's what certainly happens in estrangement, where when people who are estranged, and I'm sure this happens in marriages too, um, say they want an apology. They don't want an apology for one thing. They want it for their entire childhood or for who the whole other person is. So I'd say that's one of the worst. And the second thing that happens is when communication breaks down as a result of that so strongly that it moves from arguments or disagreements into contempt, where, you know, there are truly contemptuous, hurtful discussions aimed to hurt. I think that's where problems in marriages and problems in estrangement come together. Um, We've learned now from decades of psychological research that it takes an awful lot of positive events in a relationship to overcome a single really negative one. Uh, You know, there's a psychologist who calls it a factor of 10. Like if you've, you know, insulted your partner inadvertently, it takes 10 good things to overcome that. Mm -hmm. It has to do with these conflicts that move beyond any real disagreement and where there's identity threat that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's making, the person feel like they're a truly genuinely bad person. Mm -hmm. I think that cuts across marriage and the estrangements. And that's where I think outside help is really needed. It's, it's hard for couples who've gotten to that point. I think I'm curious as to in your, your work on it, if that rings a bell or not, and whether people sort of talk about that kind of thing. My first couple of thoughts are one on a similar note, the worst question I've ever asked a married couple. So just in my own life, I I love talking to to older married couples. And one question I asked was, uh, what's the biggest fight you've ever been in? And I realized doc that that fight never gets, (laughs) I feel like resolved. It's more of a, Hey, we've made this a demilitarized zone, as you said. So you probably started them up again, right? I I really did. (laughs) So not going to ask that again, but, uh, it, 
the second thing I thought of was, I don't know, I'm not sure if you've read, uh, the meaning of marriage. It's a book by Tim Keller. And he talks about how, uh, marriage is, you know, such a unique thing because your partner sees you at your most vulnerable, at your truest, uh, core, you know, like most innocent version of yourself, I feel like, or the most raw form and, uh, how it, it, it makes me sad to think that someone could feel rejected rejected or feel like a bad person because of their partner. It's like, gosh, how can we avoid that at all costs? You know, just, I would say though, to your question, we have had couples on both sides that were able to get through adversity affairs, whatever their challenge was. And we've had couples who were not able to, and it seems like on both of those sides, it's exactly what you talked about. You have the couples who were able to forgive and were willing to work through it. And then you had the ones that felt so betrayed that there wasn't a turning point for them. They felt like they couldn't come back from it. And it just kind of seemed like it was, yeah. Hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was one or the other. And it's also even not so much the event of what it means, you know, like, yeah, uh, I, I think the, that that's absolutely right. And, you know, I, I think the, the one way which the very long married elders said, and I think you both actually alluded to this earlier, they really did have a mindset that marriage was forever, that you were in this for good. Mm-hmm. So, so they didn't think about a starter marriage. You know, they had the idea mm-hmm. that you were in it. Now, obviously, if there was abuse or something really dramatically awful, they would get out of it. But the idea that you're in it for good does make you, you know, try harder. I mean, it's a kind of thing. It's, I think, you know, when you were saying what you think, you know, you know, I'm sort of in this and I have to deal with it. So I think that mentality is very helpful for couples and for family relationships that it's it's not just, I can easily end this. It's that I am in this for the long run Mm. and I have to work through these things. So I think that helps people too. Asking the question, I think, more so for our generation than anything and the generations to come, were there any marriages or couples you talked to that said they had a perfect marriage? Yeah. No. Answer, (laughs) absolutely no. There really, really was no perfect marriage for everybody at the end of the line of married life. Uh felt there were ups and downs, that there were difficulties, even if it hadn't been affecting them, you know, your kids get sick, you become unemployed. Mm. Uh, There are other issues uh, which uh, which occur. So many people described very happy marriages. And over the course of life, as being able to stay in a long marriage is one of their life's true accomplishments. Mm. But no, there was absolutely no such thing as a perfect marriage. And indeed, what would it be? I mean, you know, you'd be in some kind of a, you know, Stepford wife, husband. I mean, it's hard to envision what that kind of uh, perfection would be. I think it's this concept that, you know, the big picture I learned from talking to those folks is that if you can do it, staying married over 40 or 50 or 60 years is really sublime. I mean, it's an experience that you can only appreciate once you're there. For those people, it's really, really good. It's Mm. worth striving for. It's something that, you know, they almost can't describe how meaningful Mm. it is in their lives. So the one thing I'd recommend too, as I know we're probably nearing the end of our time, is go talk to those people like you folks have. I mean, for folks who are thinking of getting married, one of the biggest problems in our society is we don't go talk to old people. I mean, it's only been in about the last hundred years or so that people have gone to anyone other than the oldest person they knew for advice about something like marriage. And look, older people may not be the ones, you know, to reprogram the smart TV or or tell you who the latest Mm. reality TV star is, but they are the best sources we have on keeping a relationship together through hard times and getting over difficulties. So even though their lives were different, you know, you can get this kind of advice from actual living, breathing people in your orbit. Mm. And I I think it's really worthwhile. It's so humbling to talk to you who have, you've had thousands of these conversations and the depth of wisdom that I can only imagine that you have as a result is just, well, you could see it in your books. And part of me just wants to 
sit down and have a seven hour conversation with you. But in lieu of that, well, when the world opens up, I'll get down there to Nashville at some point. <laughs> yes. No, I'm going to really make you my a... new pen pal. If, if you don't mind, I like just, it. Gonna... <laughs> yeah. I like it. We're going to touch our, no, I, and really great questions. Thanks so yeah. much. Really a fascinating, uh, spend with you. I really appreciate it. I would like if, if you don't mind answering one more question. So you talked about the causes of estrangement. You talked about um, how to mend those estrangements. But at the beginning of this episode, we talked about kind of the, the practice of communication. And do you have any uh, qualities or habits that we can practice proactively like communication or yeah, any qualities that we can be focused on developing that help us have uh, healthy conflicts so we avoid these estrangements altogether? It's a great question. And there's one that actually, there's one piece of advice that overlaps both marriages and, and estrangements because there's been research done on both. So one of the best things that people can do, and there actually is, there have been experiments of this. If couples, for example, but when confronted by a difficulty, and it's going to sound simple, but it's really extraordinarily effective, either write or talk from the other person's perspective, or if that's too mm. difficult, um, writing down, and people have done this experimentally, if you're having a disagreement and you sit down and write from the perspective of, of an objective third party who has both people's interests in mind, that there have been a number of experiments in psychology that show that's a very powerful way to do it, is to mm. sit and write or think, what would an objective third party advise us? Mm. And I found that with people getting out of estrangements, they developed that ability to take on the role of the other person and to see the world from their side. When we're angry and feel rejected, that's extraordinarily difficult. So almost using artificial means of trying to mm. understand the meaning behind the behavior, that was one critical thing. You know, beyond that, I loved some of the concrete tips older people gave. If I have time, I'll just say one or two. They really believe in the not going to bed angry rule, which is mm. if you ask almost any very old person, one of their rules, uh, they'll say that. I delve deeply into it. Um, and they really mean by that, you know, don't hold grudges. Don't, you know, for them, kind um, symbolically, carrying an argument over for two or three days, is just more than needs to happen. On a smaller level, I'll tell you the one piece of advice that really helped my marriage. They say uh, that when you're having a difficulty, when you're having a persistent disagreement, stop and ask, who is this more important to? So for whom is the outcome going to be more important? My story was, so we moved into this old Victorian house, and there was a rusty old clawfoot tub in the downstairs bathroom. I wanted that taken out and a luxurious shower put in. And we argued about it perseveratively. And I was actually doing, you know, the work on this book. And they kept on saying, so I said, okay, this matters more to her. So I'm just going to like leave the field. Mm. I don't care as much. It looks unbelievably beautiful. It was totally the right decision. I was absolutely wrong. Mm. So I think that that's a principle that it's a small principle that has bigger impact that, you know, decide who the issue is more important to and let that person have their way. So I think there are small tips like that, that you learn over time that are mm. um, pretty good. Gosh. Well, I think that's a, a really good place to end. And um, God, it, it, there's so many thoughts that I have, uh, mm -hmm. especially, you know, and I feel like marriage is a choice. And what you said about choosing to empathize with your spouse's point of view is so powerful because we do this all the time with our political views. We, we empathize with the other people, you know, that we're, we're around. We empathize with our in-laws, but making the choice to be like, no, this is the person that I'm going to actually grow to understand their point of view better is, is a choice. And, um, it's tough, but honestly, doc, this show is nothing more than a shadow of your work. And to save you the seven hours of, of in, in-person conversation for now, I'll take you up on it later. But, uh, I'm just going to continue to read your books. And for those listening that want to uh, read Doc's books on uh, 30 Lessons for Living, 30 Lessons for Loving, and Fault Lines, I would highly recommend all of them. We're going to link them down below, as well as some articles he's written for the Huffington Post, including uh, the marriage mistakes uh, almost everybody makes and three questions everyone should ask before marriage. This guy is full of advice. and Well, you know, 
I, I'm thanks. And listen, I'll say to your listeners, if you can just include this, that, you know, uh, my research team and I, you know, do these projects and we are thinking about what should the next book be about. So if people have ideas for ah. what a great big interview study that looks for people's lessons for some domain of life, um, we'll happily take their uh, suggestions too. Fan- fantastic. I love that. Well, it was. All right, well, a- thanks so much. True honor to meet you, doctor. Thanks for the time. Truly an honor. Thanks so much.